Welcome to Mosaic. I'm your host, Susan Schulman Pertnoy. Mosaic is Jewish Federation of Palm Beach County's weekly news magazine, exploring the most critical issues facing Jews here and around the world. The son of immigrants has a chance encounter that turns him into a white supremacist. What makes a person hate like that? And what makes him stop hating? We'll hear the answer to those questions and more today on Mosaic. You are the book that lights the spark and the hand that passes the torch, the fuel that powers the change that betters the world across town, across oceans, the hand that soothes the spirit that survived the unthinkable. You are there in the darkest of times to strengthen our community. Moving your superhero movers and moving horror stories. Hey, I heard you're looking for a mover. I got a deal for you. Staring on this mover out there! As a former police officer, I've heard all of the moving horror stories. But you can trust me and my pros, and we'll have you saying... Opa! Call Star Star Greek. Good Greek, moving in storage. Your superhero movers... The Levin Palace at Morse Life is leasing luxury residences for ages 65 plus, offering more than first class amenities and white glove service. Life at the Palace is like life aboard a luxury cruise ship with more things to enjoy life now. More fabulous food, more fun, more friends, more family, more freedom, more future. Morse Life is more life. Live it at the Palace. Start your fabulous future now. Call 561-537-3402. Joining me today is Christian Picciolini, the first former neo-Nazi I've ever interviewed. Welcome to Mosaic. Thank you, Susan. Your story is remarkable. Thank you. You spent your teenage years as a white supremacist, and as a matter of fact, at the young age of 14, you were, you were um, radicalized into the movement. Mm. Can you tell us about your childhood? Sure, yeah, I was uh, recruited into America's first uh, neo-Nazi skinhead group in 1987 uh, at 14 years old, but before that I actually had a you know pretty typical um, childhood and upbringing. Uh, my parents are Italian immigrants who came to the U.S. in the mid-60s uh, and because they were immigrants had to work very hard to support the family. So I often didn't see my parents for you know seven days a week or 14 or 16 hours a day. So I grew up feeling, uh, you know, despite the love that was around me, felt very abandoned by my parents. And at a young age, I didn't know what I had done to push them away, and I started to act out. Tell us about that actual event, the night uh, when you were 14 years old, that night in the alley that yeah. turned into your joining the group. Yeah, I was kind of starting to be delinquent at that point as a teenager, trying to get my parents' attention. and. Uh, one day when uh, I was standing in an alley in 1987, uh, a man came up to me as I was smoking a joint uh, and he pulled a joint from my mouth and he looked me in the eyes and he said, that's what the communists and the Jews want you to do to keep you docile. Uh, you know, if I'm being honest, at 14 I didn't know what a communist was, <laughs> if I'd met a Jewish person or even what the word docile meant. Uh, but it seemed like it was the first time that somebody had actually seen me. Uh, that man turned out to be America's first neo-Nazi skinhead leader. Uh, and I suddenly had gone from this powerless, bullied 14-year-old uh, to now somebody who felt accepted, who felt you know, somewhat powerful, or at least the perception of power. Once I shaved my head and I put on boots, the bullies avoided me. Wow, it, that, no, no, that's a quite a lure to, to have that power. Um, what's the progression of events that took place for you mm -hmm. up until the time that you actually started to partake in acts of violence? Well, I, I think I started to really kind of go through the motions on day one. I wanted to show that I wanted to be part of something, even though I didn't understand it at the time, because it really had, had taken me from this kind of position of where I felt like I was nothing into something where suddenly people saw me again. Uh, and it was kind of a progression of, of indoctrination through propaganda, uh, plus violence. I mean, violence was almost the price of admission 
to be a part of this, to stay relevant in this. Um, but I was more involved in, uh, eventually, in the propaganda making, in the music making. I started a band that made racist music to, to recruit other people. Can you tell me what type of violence you actually did commit? Yeah, uh, you know, our group was mostly involved in a lot of street fights. Uh, so we would, you know, sometimes it would be other gangs, uh, but sometimes it was more coordinated against uh, other groups who happened to be white, actually anti-racist, uh, you know, white activists that we actually came to blows with a lot over those days. Um, but I have to say that, you know, the violence, even though mine was mostly making music, I think instructed people to commit acts of violence. The music that I made was a call to action. It was to inspire people to get angry. But there's a lot of hate in that. What fuels that oh, hate? Yeah. Oh, I think it was, uh, looking back now, you know, 30 years later, it, for me it was self-hatred. Uh, it was the fact that I, I hated who I was and I was willing to project that onto other people as hatred towards them to make myself feel better. And I can tell you that you know I've I've met you know over a thousand people in that movement, and and almost everybody I've gotten to know, uh, I would say that it's that same self hatred being projected. Did you ever feel any remorse while you were committing such acts of hate? Of course, yeah. Every time, uh, I don't think that a day went by in those eight years where I was involved that I didn't have doubts, uh, that I didn't want to leave. Um, that I didn't question what I was doing to stay relevant. But of course, that's not the kind of environment where you can seem vulnerable, where you, know, you can kind of tell your feelings to your mates. Um, well, as a matter of fact, didn't you become quite the leader in the movement? Yeah, I was a leader. I became a leader at, at uh, 19, 20 years old of that group. Uh, and I, you know, my goal was to make sure that people could be seen on the streets, could be feared on the streets, and sometimes that was through violence. We're going to talk some more with you about this, but we're going to take a break right now. Coming up, how Christian Picciolini found compassion and the impact that had on his life and the lives of many. What's the best kept secret in new cars? It's that you can get a brand new Mini at Brandon Mini Palm Beach for under $21,000, which includes free maintenance for three years. No kidding. Plus, free membership to the fun Mini Club of South Florida for road trips and autocross, and even more with club room social events. Mini is more than just driving. It's about having fun with the Brandon Mini community. Learn about Brandon Mini at BrandonMini.com. Minis for under $21,000, free maintenance, Mini Club, and Club Brandon benefits. It's a no-brainer. Brandon Mini is the right choice. Eat, drink, and enjoy Shabbat services at Temple Beth El's Friday Night Happenings. Cocktail reception and kosher dinner at 5.30, followed by our creative, musically driven Shabbat service. Traditional to progressive, the food and music change every Friday, and you'll want to stay for complimentary dessert. Plan to spend the whole evening here, and you'll walk away and you'll say, wow, we're coming back next week. Welcome at Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat services at Temple Beth El. Open to everyone. Join us every Friday night. Moving storage, your superhero movers. More moving horror stories. Think it's a good idea for your friends to show up with pizza and beer to help you move? Wrong. Amateurs. Is there a real mover out there? As a former police officer, I've heard all of the moving horror stories. But you can trust me and my pros, and we'll have you saying... Opa! Call Star Star Greek. Good Greek, moving in storage, your superhero movers. We're back speaking with Christian Picciolini and your involvement in the neo-Nazi movement as a teenager mm -hmm. uh, through the age of 22, 23. Yeah. What was the catalyst that made you want to leave? Well, you know, I think it, ultimately for me, the most powerful thing was the compassion that I received from the people that I least deserved it at a time when I least deserved it. Uh, I had opened a record store in 1995 just before I left the movement to sell this racist music. Uh, and I never expected people, because I was very you know, visible and vocal at that time, even in, in the late 80s and early 90s without the internet. But it was you know, people who were black or Jewish or gay who would come into my store and treat me with respect. They would ask me about my day. And I think, I know now, looking back, that they were attacking me with compassion. Uh, even though they knew I was this bad person and it worked because suddenly 
well, not suddenly, over time, you know, I started to recognize that I had much more in common with them than the people I had surrounded myself with, that I actually respected them more as human beings than, than the people I had called my brothers and give, sisters. Give, an, uh, give us an example. I know you had a young black Yeah, um, that was a powerful purchaser. moment. Yeah, so I had a customer come in who was this, you know, this teenage, uh, you know, black kid, and, and he was always kind of happy when he would come in. Uh, and one day he wasn't so happy. Uh, and this was after s several months of me being open, I'd gotten to kind of know him as he came into my store. And when he came in that day and he wasn't, uh, you know, his normal self, I asked him what was wrong. Uh, and he got really upset. Uh, and he told me that his mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And suddenly I could relate to this person who I'd always kept outside of my social circle because my own mother had been diagnosed with breast cancer. And suddenly I found myself bonding with this person and talking about you know, things that I, I didn't even talk about with my own close friends at the time. And I felt very close to him and, and saw that you know, we had really bonded. And that was just one of many moments that I had with people who challenged me, challenged the demonization that I was having in my head and suddenly replaced it with humanization. Didn't your own wife challenge you? Oh yeah, well my family did. So at 19 I was married. Uh, and at 19 we had our first son and at 21 our, our second son and that was the first thing in my life to challenge the sense of identity, community and purpose that I had found in this movement. Because I had to ask myself, you know, did I want to be a hater or a father and a husband and I knew that both couldn't really coexist. Uh, and as far as community, I had to ask myself again, you know, is it this community that I kind of surrounded myself with or is it the one I'd physically given life to? And suddenly, you know, I had this challenge. I, I didn't make the right decision at the time. I wish I did. Um, I chose the movement because I was so afraid of starting over with a new identity, community, and purpose that I ended up losing my family over it. I never gave up on them and they never gave up on me, which I'm very grateful for. So at what point did you just break, take a break from the movement? It was, and I remember very vividly, it was January 96. Uh, I was very ashamed to sell this racist music in my store, uh, so I removed it from the inventory, and it was so much of my revenue that I couldn't keep the store open. But I kind of did that intentionally because I knew it would give me some space to break away because I was leading this group. Um, and I told them, you know, I just needed some time to repair my family and to find a job. And that was 23 years ago, almost 24 years ago, and I never had any intention of going back. Although it did take me a couple of years to actually start speaking out against what I had done. Were you ever afraid of your life because you left? I mean, you were the head and then now you just disappeared. You know, I still receive threats um, almost every day. It's 23 years since I've left, but I have to say that nothing would have been more dangerous to me or to the people around me. Uh, I was more in danger when, if I would have stayed. Uh, you know, being a part of this, this hateful, violent movement, I think would have destroyed me. You spent a number of years trying to figure out what to do next. Yeah. And I think at one point you had a friend that really helped you because you were really at a low point. Yeah. Um, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so it was about four or five years after I had left the movement and I was trying to really outrun my past. I, you know, was hoping to move and make new friends and kind of, you know, forget about what I had done. And even though I was treating other people with a lot of respect during that time, and I certainly had abandoned my ideology, uh, I still was pretty miserable. Um, until a friend came to me and she said, you know, I don't want to see you die. And I had been waking up very depressed and, and wishing, frankly, that I hadn't woken up. Uh, and she encouraged me to go apply for a job at IBM. Uh, which to me sounded crazy because I had been, you know, kicked out of six high schools, one of them twice. I didn't go to college at that point. I didn't even own a computer and I was an ex-Nazi. Um, and in, in, you know, 1999, she said, well, go apply. They've got entry-level positions. And I went in and uh, I got a job installing computers. It was an entry-level job, just kind of installing computers at large corporations and schools. Uh, and I was so excited because my life kind of had meaning, there was purpose again, until I figured out where they were sending me my first day and then suddenly I was horrified. They were sending me on my first day of work to install the computers at my old high school, the same one I'd been kicked out of twice. Oh my God. Yeah, and I was terrified because I thought, well, you know, they were gonna fire me, they were gonna out me, and all of a sudden my life would be miserable again. 
Uh, and who did I see in the first few minutes but the old black security guard, Mr. Holmes, who I had been in a fist fight with, who I had had confrontations with. Um, and I didn't know what to say to him when I saw him except for that I was sorry. Uh, and he looked me in the eyes and he said, thank you. That makes you feel really good. It doesn't do a whole lot for me. <laughs> I'm sure <not. laughs> And we sat and we talked and, and you know, I told him my story and he, for, he truly forgave me, but he encouraged me to go out and repair the damage that I had caused. And I've been doing that for 23 years, or at least I've been trying to. How important is it for you to tell your story? Well, you know, every time I do an interview, I always have somebody reach out to me afterwards and say, you know, my story is a lot like yours, but I haven't left yet, uh, but I think I want to leave. So I think it's important not just to reach, you know, people who are in these extremist groups, but to understand that any young person who's looking for a sense of identity, community, and purpose could be led into this direction. And today with the internet, we didn't have the internet 30 years ago. Uh, Nowadays, it's so much easier for marginalized young people to kind of fall into this themselves because there's so much propaganda online. So it is important fake to say... Fake news, a ton of fake news. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of propaganda that's leading people in those directions, and I just want people to know that it is a dead-end road, that there is no point in trying to hate somebody else um, because we really all kind of need each other here. Uh, and, you know, all of the ideas that we have about difference and that, you know, that's all the beauty in the culture, but... Fundamentally, you know, we really do have the same issues that we want our families to be safe. We want our children to be healthy and have an education. And I think that's where we can come to. We do. And we have to take one last break. And then we want to talk about the wonderful work that you're doing. We'll Thank be you. right back. Coming up, what Christian Picciolini wants us to know about online hatred. Picture living aboard a luxury cruise ship with first-class service and the best amenities 24-7. Life at Tradition is just like a cruise ship that doesn't leave port. With more fabulous food, more fun with friends and family, a more fulfilling future, more care when you need it, and more freedom when you don't. Our elegant assisted living residences provide so much more, so you can make the most of every day. Rent an apartment at Morse Life and see how much more life can be. We're back talking with Christian Picciolini and the work that you're presently doing. And as a matter of fact, you've helped over 300 supremacists disengage from the movements. That's amazing. I want to know how you do it. What, you, what, what is the methodology? Uh, well, I have an organization called the Free Radicals Project and we work with all forms of extremism. Uh, people who are in those movements, we help to disengage them, to try and show them that there's a better path. Uh, and to really join this this kind of global citizenry uh, again. Um, and it doesn't mean I debate them. It doesn't mean I meet them in the middle ideologically. It means I do a lot of listening for what I call potholes in their lives. Those Talk things, about that. Yeah, potholes are the things that we encounter from the day we're born. The traumas, uh, the grie you know, the grievances that we develop, the oftentimes it could be mental illness or joblessness or poverty, but even privilege. Privilege, if it keeps us so isolated, can also be a pothole that can detour us to the fringes where there are all sorts of extremist narratives. Uh, everything from suicide to drug abuse to being a neo-Nazi or even to going to Syria to join ISIS. There are all sorts of narratives there waiting for vulnerable, marginalized people who don't have places in the real world uh, to promise them paradise somewhere else. And that's what happened to me at 14. And now through my work, I really try and be that person that I wish would have come up to me in that alley at 14 years old instead of the neo-Nazi skinhead to offer a different perspective, to offer a different direction, and to help people disengage from hate. Talk about some of the people that you have assisted. I know there's somebody that was a prior uh, military. Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've worked with, gosh, so many people, uh, but one specific story, I think the one you're thinking of, was a, a man who, 31-year-old man from New York who had enlisted in the military after 9-11, and he had gone to basic training uh, and was injured during basic training and sent home while he saw his you know, brothers and sisters going off to war. And he didn't go into the military, you know, uh, hating anybody. Uh, and certainly the military didn't make him hate anybody, but when he came back, he was so angry that he couldn't go fight. 
you know, and protect America against what he then saw as, a, as an Islamic threat, he came back Islamophobic. He hated Muslims. Uh, and he reached out to me, he read my book, uh, and you know, I spoke to him for a couple of months about what he was feeling, and then you know, one day he called me and he said, uh, you know, I saw a Muslim man praying in the park and it really took everything in me to not go to him and, and kick him. Uh, at that point, I said, I don't care what you're doing tomorrow, but I'm flying to New York to come sit with you. Wow. Uh, and I did. And one of the first questions I asked him was, you know, have you ever met a Muslim person before? And he said, no, they're evil. I don't like them. They don't like me. And, you know, and what he didn't know was I already had made arrangements uh, to, uh, to go visit a mosque, to, to take him to go meet with an imam there and, and to just experience it. He had never been in that situation Was he before. reluctant or did Oh, he? of course he was reluctant. You know, he got nervous. He had a panic attack when I told him where we were going and, you know, he turned very white, maybe whiter than I think he wanted to be at that <laughs> point. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, I told him where we were going and finally, he, you know, he agreed and when we got there, we were late. I told the imam that we would be there at a certain time. Uh, and when we arrived, we only had a few minutes left before he had to prepare for a wedding. And uh, we took it, we went in, finally convinced him to go in, and we sat around a table for two hours, uh, you know, talking about our families and life and faith and, and Chuck Norris for some strange reason. Both the imam and this man that I was working with loved Chuck Norris and they started to say lines from his films back and forth. <laughs> Uh, and you know, I'm happy to say that you know now they go out weekly. They have you know falafel. They go out for pizza. They have coffee, uh, and you know he's still a Christian man who now has this new family of, of friends. Uh, and I'm happy to say that you know he's he's fully disengaged. So you have 300 success stories, 299 success stories Something in like addition that. to that. Yeah. yeah, I've worked probably with over a thousand you know people at this point. But I would, it's a long process. People don't change overnight. It's scary to leave. It's sometimes difficult to start over. Um, but my goal is to always get them, to put them in situations where they come to the conclusion themselves that they were wrong. It's not about me telling them that they're wrong. It's not about even me thinking that they're evil people because I've trained myself to see the child and not the monster, whether they're 16 or 60. Uh, and then I really try and work on building human resilience. It's amazing once you do that, that people don't have a need to blame somebody else for their shortcomings. It must take, it, it must take a, a, a lot of resources to be able to do this. Oh, it does. I have to build a team around everybody I work with, and I do believe in, in, in working locally. Uh, so, you know, if somebody contacts me, uh, you know, in any city, I have to go there and I, I am building a team around them. Uh, so it does take a lot of resources. And, and unfortunately, uh, for 23 years, I've been kind of self-funding this. I do speaking engagements around the world to really f take me to the places where I need to meet people and also to pay for some of the services that they require. What do you think uh, people could do or parents could do or your parents might have been able to do mm -hmm. differently so that ch kids of your, of your teenage years don't want to be Mm -hmm. uh, join the movement. Was, is there anything yeah. that we could do as a society? Well, you know, I think our pre-radicalization starts the day we're born. But we start hitting those potholes right away and sometimes it's not until, you know, 14 or 40 where we actually get detoured. So I would say that as parents, as teachers, as adults, you know, we're failing our children by not recognizing that we need to amplify their passions from the earliest age possible. That, you know, once they feel marginalized, they're already starting to to dabble in some of these kind of narratives. And you know, for, for any young person who feels marginalized, that means that we are failing as adults. Uh, so we need to find a way to amplify their voices, uh, to enable their passions, uh, and sometimes to listen instead of prescribing what we think the solutions are. Uh, because young, young people are smart and they're idealistic and they're motivated. I was at 14, had a football coach or you know, an art teacher come to me in that alley when I was 14, I would have gone with them. It just didn't occur that way. The Anti-Defamation League recently came out with a statement in, which is very startling and I want to read it so I get it right that they reported that right-wing extremists were linked to more murders in the United States in 2018 than any other year since 1995, which is when Timothy McVeigh right. killed 168 people in That's the right. Oklahoma City bombings. Right. That is such a startling 
statistic. Yeah. What are some of the solutions that we can use to combat this? Well, I think first we need to stop debating on if this is a problem or not. I still hear that debate, unfortunately, you know, where there are some people who will not really recognize white supremacy as a violent threat. Uh, and I would say that this isn't just a local problem, it isn't just a regional problem, and it's not even just an American problem. These groups have been developing transnational uh, alliances for decades. So this is now with the internet a, a global extremist movement, a global terrorist movement. Because not only you know, in the United States are we seeing these numbers, but all over the world they're starting to see a, you know, a rise in, in extreme right crimes and extreme right killings, and certainly in rhetoric. So this is something that you know, is imminent. This is something that is facing us right now, and we really do need to, to take a stand against it and recognize it as, as a threat to our national security. Our local federation teaches our young people about how to combat anti-Semitism and anti-Israel sentiment. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice on how to teach our community about neo-Nazis and white supremacists? I don't know if I should be the person kind of giving that advice um, but what I would say is that you know it's reaching our youngest children this propaganda now because of the internet it's the first time in my life where I've had parents contact me saying my eight-year-old is starting to say things that are not right my nine-year-old is denying the Holocaust uh, and that to me is very very scary because Recruiters are not looking for you know the strongest. They're looking for the most vulnerable. They're right. going to the places like depression forums online or even over multiplayer online games to try and recruit young people. Uh, so I would say you know as as a community, we need to recognize that this danger exists. And once we recognize it, then we can put into place the, the learning that it will take to not succumb to it. Are you optimistic about the future? <laughs> please, please say yes. <laughs> I am. I, I mean, despite you know all of these dire warnings that, that I'm saying, which are very important, uh, I am hopeful because you know, I believe in us, I believe in America, I believe in democracy, and I believe in people. Uh, and I know that you know, good will triumph over evil. Thank you so much for joining us, and My I appreciate pleasure, all the work that you do. Thank you very much. Mosaic is brought to you by these generous sponsors and underwriters. Learn how you can support Mosaic by visiting jewishpalmbeach.org slash mosaic.